we've spent 10 years, there are still bugs that were already known when Jot was published and we still encounter them. So we, it seems we need to talk about this stuff. So uh, first of all, what is uh, JWS? It, uh, that's uh, what the first RFC specifies, is that you have some kind of JSON that is signed. So it's like XML signatures, only on a yet another format. And it's basically comprises of uh, a so-called protected header, although we'll see how unprotected this is in reality. And then we have a dot, so this is a concatenation sign. And then we have uh, another part, the payload itself. And then we have a signature all separated by dots and we are using uh, Base64, but Base64 uses, you know, the 26 uh, lowercase characters, the 26 uppercase characters and the 10 numbers, but that is only 62. So you need to have two additional symbols to cover the 64 symbols. And by, this, uh, by default, you have the plus sign and the uh, slash but uh, the URL safe encoding uses the underscore and the dash or hyphen so that uh, it can be passed in URLs uh, more easily, although we'll later see why that is also not a, bad, not a good idea. And then you calculate this signature on this whole first part, so we treat it as ASCII, and yeah, it could be because we only use uh, characters that are inside ASCII. And uh, the thing is, although we have the payload inside, so the token is kind of a self-contained structure. Uh, if you look up this RFC, there is this appendix F which says that in some applications you might want to remove this because uh, you are putting the token, uh, so this is not yet a token, this is uh, Java's uh, JSON Web Signatures, and you can say that I just want to sign something and attach the signature as a kind of metadata. So, for example, I sign an HTTP request and put the signature into an HTTP header. Then, obviously, I won't have it uh, inside the token. So, then this part is an empty string. And, yeah, if you ever use SOAP with uh, signatures, in XML signatures using uh, Web Services Security, this is what you used. Uh, but this is the same with JSON. So, that is the first layer of the protocol. And then we have Jot. It, it says you need to pronounce it Jot. Yeah, it's, it sounds ridiculous. In Hungarian, uh, we say Jevete or Jevete if we are from Alta. And uh, <laughs> this one builds on uh, JWS. Uh, usually, when we try to just sign it, or you can also encrypt it. But we won't talk about that because, first of all, not many people actually use it, and it's it's its own kind of worms, but at least not as prevalent. So. Uh, uh, from a certain point of view, you could say that uh, uh, Jot builds on JWS, so the signature format, but on the other hand, you can say that uh, it's an implementation of JWS, and most people kind of put an equation sign uh, be, uh, between these two. And uh, what it says, you have, a, a, you have a list of claims. What, what do I mean by claim? So, I, for example, the payload contains that my username is dnat and my user ID is 1 and I'm not an administrator. That is a set of claims and I need to substantiate those claims by having a signature that was done by some trusted party so that these claims can be validated without actually going to that trusted party and asking him. Although we don't really know why that is a good thing to have, but yeah. And uh, some of these claims are standardized. For example, uh, when, when it was issued, when this claim expires and needs to be refreshed or something like that. And uh, the problem is that many people actually using them, for example, for stateless session management. And uh, on this URL, uh, you get, uh, get the opportunity to download the slides and clip these. Uh, the, the, this was a really good uh, blog post six years ago, why you shouldn't use this for session management, yet we have people doing that. And uh, if you go forward, this uh, you cannot possibly read any of this, but this uh, was the the illustration uh, in that uh, in that blog post that says, yeah, I can make uh, Jot sessions work by, for example, saying that, uh, well, I try to read it from my screen. So, for example, saying that, yeah, I can change the signing key 
so that uh, uh, when a user needs to invalidate the session, but then I have a usability problem because now every single user is logged out when I invalidate the key, so it, it cannot possibly work. Maybe I can, I can improve, uh, no, I cannot. So you need, to, you need to sacrifice either availability or usability or security, and this just doesn't work because uh, while you can declare a set of values that, that are uh, features of uh, using uh, Jolt for sessions, they contradict each other. So I can say, yes, I love that it's being stateless, so that I don't have to hit some centralized server every time I need to validate a session, but then you cannot invalidate the session because then you need a centralized server that maintains the list of invalid sessions. So it's just kind of pointless and uh, it will never work. So uh, please look at this and, and try to see why, why it's, it just doesn't make sense. And uh, yeah, stateless is bad, at least in this uh, approach. So it's, it's just the typical uh, technical version of if something looks too good to be true, then it isn't, simply. Uh, so we'll go over to design issues. So first of all, I already mentioned that there is the so-called protected header, uh, which contains uh, the so-called ALG header, uh, which is uh, short for algorithm. And that offers lots of flexibility, and that flexibility is... Uh, is provided in a way that the untrusted party presents you with something and that includes how I should interpret that uh, something and I will just gladly take it from the untrusted party and use it and make decisions based on that uh, information. So uh, the first and really most tragic uh, bug and it still exists some places uh, there is a possible uh, value that I set the ALG to none, which means that I don't have any security in this token. And many implementations say that, okay, if it's set to none, then by definition, the token is valid without any kind of signature. And then I can just rewrite those claims. So for example, set my username from DNET to admin or anything like that, because now I can change it freely because there is no signature. And... Uh, Banya Swanath is not here, although he would love this. Uh, now I can use parser differentials. So for example, many people said, okay, I cannot touch this application, but I have a web application firewall and I will set it to catch where I, where I say alg is none. But then what if I write none with a, a capital O and a capital E, so that the web application firewall rule will see, okay, it's not none with lowercase letters, so let it pass but then the parser will accept this, oh, okay, it's none, now because I compare it uh, in a case-insensitive manner. So that's, that's why, why it's, it's uh, not, always a, not always a good thing to just say that, okay, we fixed that one instance, no, but it didn't fix all the others. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is that uh, you need to assume that the server actually checks these signatures. So. One of the first things I do when I, when I have to test an application that has a Jolt token is I try to just change something and do not modify the signature at all. And sometimes it just works because that, that is a typical fail open situation. So unless the unit tests or integration tests have a test case for what if there is an invalid signature, it just, since we accept every signature, all the positive tests work because, you know, not checking a valid signature is not a bug but not checking an invalid signature, yeah, that's a bug, but many people don't catch it. And there is also this uh, API uh, usability issues that can lead to uh, problems. For example, uh, in the Node.js uh, library, they had a method called verify and the method called decode, and one of those checked the validity, the other just parsed it and then ignored the signature because, you know, and uh, the problem is, even now, I don't really know from heart which one is the secure one. So, yeah, uh, they, 
you see, the, the root cause, again, is that it comes from the 1990s perspective that we have a perimeter, and outside is the bad, bad, wild world, and the inside is the cozy home where everything is safe and secure and come to daddy. And uh, they say that, yeah, you will verify the signature at the perimeter, and inside you'll just pass it, and that's why you can use the other method, because it's already been checked by someone else. But that is always a bad idea, that's what zero trust is all about and I think the whole IT world is going towards it uh, and we'll probably reach it in the next 20 years or so. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, uh, another problem is that uh, once we leave uh, Joe tokens and we just try to sign things, the problem is that what if I try to sign a message that will initiate some kind of uh, transaction on the server, what if I send it twice? The signature will still be intact, so this is a valid message. So, for example, if I have a, a, a sign things that says that I should be given a reward for something, then sending it twice will give me the reward twice, right? So, uh, for example, in, uh, in the SOAP world, in web service security, we had uh, timestamps and nonces so that the server can see, okay, are you already saw this one? So if it arrives within this uh, uh, timestamp expiry period, I will reject it and I can just uh, purge this record after the timestamp has elapsed because it will not be valid because it will expire. And, uh, and sure, it can be done here, so here we have uh, this so-called uh, GTI or JOT ID uh, header where you can put some random value that you only use uh, once and then you try, to, you try to store it somewhere and check whether this, I already seen this one. Uh, the problem is that it, it gets tricky because you could say that the order doesn't matter from a usability perspective, it will work for simple cases. The problem is that uh, if I store the used values in the list before actually checking the signature, then I open myself to a really nice uh, DOS uh, attack on the storage front because now attacker can send lots of invalid requests with new IDs and it will just simply fill my disk or memory or both, uh, which is the best, without those being actually valid. So it's, it's just the order of two things, yet it's so important and, and it's, it's everywhere. For example, uh, in the Linux kernel, they had this eBPF stuff so that you can upload little programs into the Linux kernel. And they all said this one with, yeah, you need to check the validity and then make the memory page read only so that the validated stuff cannot be changed. If they just switch the order, it would be unexploitable. But of course they did it in the wrong order. So it seems that putting things in the secure order is, is not a, a strong value of programmers nowadays. And then we have key management, because uh, as soon as we have keys, uh, you need key management. And uh, I copied this from the uh, already mentioned AGE or AGE tool, which is an encryption tool. And in its, in its documentation, it says that it doesn't do signing, because signing, as he said, is not a tooling problem, but a trust and key distribution problem. So it's, it's really a matter of how, how I know which key to use to actually actually verify if this signature is correct. So for example, this uh, key ID or kid uh, attribute can be used to specify which key to use for verification. But for instance, there are some issues where they accept a URL and you can just put your own URL there with your own key and it will use that key that you supply to it and will check it. So it's a trust issue. Or uh, you have this uh, JWK and JKU parameters where you can embed the public key itself in the signature. So we are back at the self-signed certificate world. Well, I proved the key which you will use to... Ver how how is, did that ever seem a good idea? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Also, the, the I, I know it's, it's, it's laughable, but... Uh, some people think that if they see a base64 value, then it's encrypted because they can, they can, for example, why did they use it for the HTTP authorization header? It's, no, but they use it so it's, it sends a false sense of confidentiality because I do not see it with my own eyes, then it might not have secrets. And uh, yeah, there is this uh, JSON web encryption stuff, which, uh, which 
solves that but as uh, you know this all old saying that uh, if you have a problem and you say I use regular expression now you have uh, two problems it's the same now you need to manage encryption keys as well and uh, they also had some problems with uh, for example in uh, you can use elliptic curve cryptography to encrypt those tokens and they had a text that involved uh, using invalid parameters and stuff so that is also uh, problematic and uh, the, you can use RSA to encrypt it and of course they they fell uh, for right hand backers attack which seems to just uh, pop up everywhere where you use RSA it's it's like uh, programmers love it uh, yeah you could do this this uh, this band tour t-shirt with that uh, okay so that's that's the confidence because usually we say Jot is about integrity, but confidentiality might also be an issue because many people will just put lots of confidential data into a token because yeah, it's a token. It's it's it should be confidential. Okay. Uh, so now we go into cryptography level. You have a question? A uh, question about the base sixty four stuff. Yeah. So I don't quite know the jot, but uh, in HTTP had a case for basic auth. Yeah. Uh, I think a part of the use case is that you could put, can't put anything in the password, even yeah. like double line breaks, and will not break HTTP headers. So maybe the, yeah, they want you to base 64 encrypted so that you don't have, put, don't have to put C data sections and so on in there. Yeah, maybe, yeah. But the, 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 the main reason is that Many people also believe that to be encrypted because they just see a random string of letters and numbers and now I cannot read it, then it must be encrypted. Okay, so cryptography. Um, first of all, most people, when they think about uh, Jot, they think about an HMAC version. And an HMAC means, uh, I think that was also mentioned in a previous presentation, uh, it's a so-called symmetric MAC. What is a MAC? It's a message authentication code. So I have a message and I want to be able to prove that it hasn't been tampered with. And it's symmetric because both the signer and the verifier has to have the same set of key, or, or sorry, the same key, which is just a singular uh, big blob of bytes. And that's, that makes it really easy to understand. So I just give this information to everyone and they can verify it. And uh, it's even mandated by the, by the standard itself, so that you need to support the, the HMAC uh, SHA-256. And that already leads us to, to problems regarding these standards. This, if there is, there, are, there is a small set of things that is required to be supported, then even if the standard supports stronger and more secure options, most people will use those that are implemented by all the libraries because they need support. Uh, so in this case, uh, they use HMAC and HMAC is just uh, kind of like a framework. So it doesn't have any, any cryptographic algorithms in itself. So you need to pick a, a hash function to use with it. And that in this case is the 256-bit uh, uh, version of SHA-2. And of course, there are two other versions which use these uh, 384 and uh, 512 uh, bit versions. Uh, so that is how you do HMAC. And uh, there are some problems with that. And the first one is that uh, HMAC is really fast. It only calls the hash function twice and applies basic steps. And SHA-2, the algorithm, uh, as Steff, I think, also mentioned, is designed to be fast, so it's uh, very GPU-friendly, it doesn't use a lot of memory because it's been designed to efficiently hash, like, megabytes and gigabytes of data really fast. So, in, a in the HMAC case, you have a secret and that can have a low entropy. So it could be like uh, an alphanumerical string that some programmer wrote into the code. So, if you know John the Ripper, uh, our favorite uh, password brute force tool, it supports these uh, jotes out of the box. So if you have a token and you just put it into jot and it is uh, secured by HMAC, it will just start brute forcing it. And I actually found tokens that were, that used the uh, HMAC secrets like one, two, three, or the string secret. Mm -hmm. So it's, if, if it looks intimidating, but if they use a, uh, such a simple uh, signing thing, then it's, it's really easily broken. And uh, of course, it has an as asymmetric version as well, so they can use RSA. And uh, by asymmetric, we mean that 
there is a private part which only the signer has and all the verifiers can have a public part and you cannot derive the private part from the public so it's safe you can have people uh, having the ability to verify your token but not create another token like that unlike with HMAC where you can actually do that and uh, now you may need the ability to have multiple keys and that's where all the kid attacks come in because you need to have a way to say which signer signed this so which key you need to uh, you need to perform this verification and uh, again it's only recommended so there might be libraries that don't even support this asymmetric uh, construction and it uses uh, this uh, PKCS uh, 1.5 which is bad and should not be used and sure, the PSS versions are available, but then again, they are just optional, not recommended, optional. So there are maybe even fewer libraries actually implementing these more secure versions. So in this case, they do a hash and then sign it with RSA. And that's how you try to uh, protect these GEO tokens. I've heard that some, some uh, COVID certificates also use such a... <laughs> things to protect uh, the, the integrity. Uh, okay. And uh, what, what's the problem with RSA? Uh, first of all, again, the verifier will just parse the protected header and uh, tries to parse the algorithm. But the problem is that what if we replace the RSA with an HMAC? And uh, for example, here, here is a CV about that. It's called key confusion attacks, where the, the verifier has a public key and the verifier parses this untrusted piece of information, but then decides that we should use this untrusted so, uh, piece of information to see how we should parse our own key, which we already have. So uh, in this case, the RSC public key is typically some kind of PEM formatted uh, public key, but that is a string, so that also could be interpreted as an HMAC static symmetric key. Uh, but uh, then we have the question, but how do we get the public key? Because other, uh, unless the, the uh, operator of the system gives it to us, you might not have that. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> and depending whether it's a public system, you might not get the public key. For example, if you have a mobile app that will check it, that might publish the public key itself. But you see, these private uh, public key uh, infrastructures are not designed for the public key to be protected. So uh, my colleague Buharator actually uh, did the, the hard part of actually implementing these attacks uh, by reading some mathematics and if you're interested in the nitty-gritty details you can read the whole blog post so the thing is uh, that uh, since there is no guarantee that you cannot get the public key from uh, a number of signatures uh, it's really easy to actually fetch the public key so uh, you need to find the greatest common denominator and we have really efficient algorithms for that because we have really smart mathematicians who created these. And uh, this is a so-called probabilistic meth method. So you get a number of results which may or may not work, but the, the resulting number of uh, options is so low that we can just brute force that small set uh, really fast because it's just you need to build those candidate public keys and verify, okay, this works, and then uh, you'll have your public key. So uh, the thing is that if you get uh, the, the more uh, signature and message pairs you get, the more chance you have to just arrive at one or two candidate key, and then you can just test all of them. So uh, the, the thing is that there is no protection for this. and. Uh, we have the tool uh, up here on GitHub, so anyone can try to uh, try to attack all the systems that use uh, RSA keys. And uh, I brought a demo for that, which was uh, created uh, by my colleague Buharator. 
and I will show you a recording of that. So uh, first, yeah, I see, see, yeah. So first we have the sign.js, which uh, signs uh, the message and prints it to the standard output. And, uh, and yeah, now we'll just uh, create a virtual environment for the Python script so that uh, we can run our own tool. And what we'll do, we use the Jolt Forgery Pi and we'll provide, uh, we copy paste it from here, the, or, uh, the original token, both of them. And now it will start calculating the greatest common denominator and try to iterate and find the, find the, uh, and that's, you see now it find the better value and then it just wrote a tempered value. So as you can see, now it's much shorter because now it doesn't have an RSA signature. Now it has an HMAX signature. And uh, as you can see, once we put the, the tempered version into the verifier, it just prints that, uh, that uh, it was successful. So if we go back, you can see that uh, we tried the first one and it's uh, and it verified correctly and we tried the second one and that didn't work so you see uh we have two candidates we pasted the first one and that verified well and we pasted the other one and that resulted in an error so it's uh it's really a brute force uh methodology but then it just works very well so uh, you only needed to try to uh possibilities so let me go back to show you and yeah hopefully not uh, hide anything so as you can see the original had a really long signature uh, maybe I'm not seeing the the dot yeah it's so this is the first dot and this is the second dot so yeah you can see the the RSA signature is really long because it has the same length as the modulus which in this case I guess is uh, 1024 or 2048 bits but in the end the the forged signature is just an HMAC so it's, it's it's much shorter yet it has the same message and now since I have the symmetric HMAC key I can just do any set of claims and have a have a signature that the server will accept so yes it's uh, the vulnerability itself is not new, but we had clients who said that, oh, but we don't care about these vulnerabilities because the public key is kept in our premises. We don't publish it. Yes, but you can guess the public key just by uh, using some mathematics by having signatures and you cannot protect signatures because th the whole point of the system is to have the signatures being public. Um, and of course, you can do uh, other stuff. <laughs> so RSC is not the only asymmetric uh, signing algorithm. You have also elliptic curve cryptography. And yeah, we have the same stuff. You can have multiple signing keys and they can be verified with public key, but it's, mu it's much shorter. And again, what you have is uh, you have uh, the P256 uh, NIST uh, EC curves. And then you have this uh, SHA-256 combination and it's the, the RFC says it's recommended plus. <laughs> and uh, in, in the footnote, they say that recommended plus means that it might become uh, mandatory in later revisions of the standard. And you also have these other two optional thingies. And this is not a typo. This, this is 12 and this is 21 because of them. And many people use this because the the iOS Secure Enclave also uses these parameters, so you can have such a design where the iOS devices can use their hardware-backed stores to actually sign these uh, tokens, so you'll have a bit more security than just st storing it in a plain text file. And uh, first of all, the problem is that uh, this is how you, you actually uh, do a, a uh, signature you have an R and an S component. And the problem is that uh, you need to have this uh, cryptographically secure random integer that you will multiply with the, with the, uh, 
with the base point and uh, the problem is that if you ever reuse that k value then you can calculate the private key itself because you can just use these two equations so you'll have the same k, k so that k uh, raised to the power of minus one will just you know uh, get out of the equation and uh, z will, will be different and then you can just uh, calculate the, the private key itself and that's for example what happened with the PlayStation 3 they could simply get the private key out of the system and then sign any kind of game or, or other application running on the system. So, so the problem with ECDSE is that you need to have a good source of randomness so that you won't compromise your own private key in the process. And uh, the other problem, this was the app level problem, but okay, you use the perfect library to actually generate the signatures. There is another problem on the verification side. So, uh, do you know the TV series, the British uh, science fiction series, uh, Doctor Who? They, they have this uh, thing called a psychic paper. And uh, as the viewers of the show, you always see that he is showing uh, the camera a blank piece of paper. But in, in reality, in their fictional reality, the person who is observing that piece of paper will see something that will convince him or her that uh, what the doctor is asking is totally legitimate. So maybe they are seeing some police identification papers or, or anything like that. So uh, uh, some guy who discovered this vulnerability said that it's the same thing in, um, in uh, elliptic curve signatures is that uh, since uh, Java 15 and up until the, uh, the fixed uh, 18 version, they ported the C++ verification into Java, but during the porting, they introduced the bug by leaving out an important check. So you see, uh, when we try to verify uh, an elliptic curve signature uh, in ECDSE, we try to, you, you, as I already mentioned, S and R are the two components of the signature. But, uh, but the, the thing is that if we allow R and S to be zero, then all these multiplications will be zero. And uh, the signature is valid if R equals X1. But... Uh, yeah, yeah, and that is calculated uh, there. That's a zero again because we multiplied by zero and that's also zero because we multiplied by zero. So what we are checking is if zero equals zero and that will always be true. So it's kind of like a psychic paper that whatever you show the server will always tell that yeah sure that's legitimate. And that's uh, what, what they, what they uh, fucked up. And the problem is that it not only affects Jode, obviously it's, it uh, affects Jode, but also for example SAML assertions, they can also use uh, EC signatures, or for example OpenID Connect, that also uses this, so it's really fucked up and you need to update your Java, or at least some of our clients actually were saved from this vulnerability because they used the Java before the version 15, so it's so old that it's not affected yet. <laughs> So now, now they have yet another reason not to update for a few years. <laughs> yeah, so, so this, this is problematic. That uh, happened to our Jenkins install during uh, Log4j. Sorry? That happened to our Jenkins install during Log4j. Yeah, Log4j had a similar thing. Yeah, it's too old to be exploitable. <laughs> and now comes the rest of it, which I couldn't really categorize, but are still epic fails that needs to be mentioned so that we'll have fun. So uh, one thing which I don't really see mentioned in, in these uh, how to secure jotes is uh, Jolt injection. So I, I tested um, PSD2 API that used Jolt uh, tokens and it in, uh, you, you need to uh, identify the TPP, the trusted uh, payment provider uh, with the Jolt because what else? And they, they somehow wanted to put the name of the TPP into the, the Jolt itself, 
but they did so by not, not a JSON uh, serializer and parser, but rather using string concatenation. So it's like name and then it ends and the untrusted data here and then it continues. So, so actually I could define my own JSON keys in the signed thing because it was signed by the trusted black box. And, and the good thing is that sure, I, I can define new keys, but what about existing ones? And the good thing is that some JSON parsers will gladly accept multiple keys in the same JSON object, and it's just that the last one will win. So if it was uh, defined before a name, then I can just overwrite it and they will accept it, because why not? Who would do such a bad thing? Uh, also leaks. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that that uh, it's URL safe and that might not be a good thing because uh, if something is URL safe, people will put it into URLs because why not? And uh, for example, the HTTP referer header is uh, usually transmitted cross domain and it's in server logs, so it appears everywhere where it shouldn't be. So up until that uh, token is invalidated, people can just misuse it. Or, for example, if you put it in the URL or a URL parameter or just into the path, then you have logs everywhere. And now we have such high stacks that uh, it's really hard to just enumerate how many places this uh, token will get into. And then, of course, it gets into the browser history, the browser caches, the proxy caches. So it's, it's, it appears everywhere. For example, the, the iOS uh, HTTP client library has the default behavior that unless the server explicitly disables caching, it will just write all the HTTP requests and responses into an SQLite file. So even <laughs> though you might be using really secure uh, storage things with secure enclave and hardware attestation, then you might have just an SQLite database that already has all the tokens anyway, <laughs> unencrypted. Uh, and if you use burp, and if you are doing web work, you probably should use ver uh, burp, uh, they have this really nice uh, tool which allows you to just uh, uh, install it from the BAP store, the Burp App Store, and then it will detect the tokens for you. So it's no, no, you don't have to fish for it in the lots of requests sent back and forth. So it will highlight those requests that include an H uh, JOT token. And then you can try to verify it if you have the key and then try to edit it and re-sign it. And it can also help with, with encryption and uh, some really basic attacks that can be done, uh, you know, without uh, uh, human intervention. But for example, it wouldn't uh, do what I already mentioned, the, the RSA key confusion attacks. So it's, it's, it, it covers the basics, but you need to do the rest by hand. And, uh, if you don't know Postvigor Labs, you should see it because it's for free and you, need, you just need to register and you will access these awesome labs. Uh, I don't have any affiliation to that, but uh, we actually send all our junior pen testers doing web work to, yeah, just complete all the labs. And they have dedicated uh, Jolt Labs with uh, eight uh, different uh, live labs. So. You just click a button, they will launch a new virtual machine that's dedicated to you with a dedicated uh, subdomain. And then you can try your skills on a real machine and uh, they will give you a nice green check mark if you manage to do that. So yeah, they obviously want to make money by selling you burp and uh, selling you certifications, but these labs are for free. So if you want to try yourself, you can just use this and we love them because they link to our repository. So, so big thanks to them. And uh, they even offer a dockerized version and some people say it's, it's cool. Uh, so you don't have to install all the things on your operating system, but you can install Docker and install the Docker container on it. Uh, so try it for free. And uh, yeah, just some closing thoughts so that, that uh, people won't say that I, I uh, criticized uh, Jolt without actually understanding it. <laughs> yes, it can be used securely for some purposes, but not all of them. So yes, you can use a uh, Jolt. Uh, it's just many people when I asked them, why did you pick a Jolt? Why did you think that this was the best decision for this problem? They say that, yeah, it was hyped. Everybody else is using it. So I guess I should too. 
<laughs> since when do we pick technologies? And, uh, and the problem is that it's not just which uh, image, image parsing library should I show No, it's a security library. So usually you protect your users by using these tokens for authenticating them. So it's not something where you can just, oh, I, I picked this one because it was, it was uh, popular. So that's one thing. And uh, a more general kind of uh, advice for anybody using, uh, doing uh, security related uh, development. If something has lots of knobs on it, people will eventually uh, turn it in the wrong way. So it's really, really uh, common for people to say that, okay, but you can use it right. You just need to tweak the knobs <laughs> in the right direction. And that developer is stupid because he turned the knob to a bad position. <laughs> it was there at the bottom of the documentation under link in a footnote that you shouldn't ever put that in there. No, it's, it, 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 you shouldn't do victim blaming like that. So. You shouldn't put knobs that have an insecure position and, and that's it. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Questions? I know maybe a GVT, G, G, oh, okay, GVT, a uh, killer uh, methods and protocol is a Passito. It's named Passito, Platform Agnostic Security Token. Uh, lesser knob, uh, newer, newer uh, mm, encryption protocol and other things do you heard of it? Yes, I, I, I read about it when they came out and uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm not saying it's bad because they had good intentions and they had good technology it's just that they, they, uh, it's it's not a not a direct drop in replacement, and uh, and it won't be a fix for people who say that, oh, if only I have a drop in replacement or a popular thing, then I, I will use it then. So yeah, you should read about it and try to use it if it fixes your use case, but. Uh, in many cases, the problem is is not not the not what they say. So nowadays, maybe you can configure your your uh, Jot uh, parser right by saying that don't read, don't parse the algorithm from the header. Use the hard coded one. So if you have an RSA public key, don't do not ever treat it as an HMAC key. Uh, but the problem is usually not that, but rather the stateless approach or, or something else. So, yes, you should try Passato if it might fix your use case. But uh, I, I, I feel like for most people it might not be the solution they would be looking for, especially if they already have their own implementation based on Jot. I, I think the saddest thing, uh, nine out of then uh, medium article recommended uh, JWT uh, <laughs> as an authentication by some Indian guys. Yeah, yeah I, I think I. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Questions? Hey, what about macaroons? How about macaroons, Stefan asked? Uh, <laughs> Hmm. Yes, uh, I, 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 I thought about including it in the presentation, especially since he's done a, a presentation last year. Uh, yeah, macaroons might be a better idea, but those, those really shine when you need to delegate these tokens for other purposes. But if not, it, it doesn't really make a difference. I read that, for example, Google has their own internal a uh, solution for it, uh, obviously using protocol buffers because Google loves their own protocol buffers. Not invented here, syndrome exists for them as well. Uh, and they, they even use them instead of X509 certificates. But uh, yeah, macaroons, I, I think only makes sense if you want to really delegate those tokens with uh, with, uh, with an attenuated scope, so they cannot be, you know, misused, abused. What 
other person would you recommend for, for a central authentication server approach so that you have an authenticated server handing out the tokens and other kind of applications? Like or all things or stuff like that. Is there a um, good alternative? In, in that case, I'd say that uh, the, the stateless approach is not that bad. So, so uh, in that case, you might have a really short uh, lifetime. Yeah. The problem I have it with, is with longer sh lifetimes, like for example, with user sessions where you might measure it in like hours yeah. and it's really easy to abuse because even though I hit logout, that token is still valid for hours. Yeah. Or for example, even longer with, with the, they, they say that, uh, I think it was even in the, in the thing where you cannot really see anything. So some people say that, yeah, they, I will set them to expire very quickly so that compromise token is not a very big deal. And now the user goes offline for a few minutes and then they have to log in again. So it's a usability problem and people will not like it. And they say, I just use refresh tokens. And I don't know who came up with refresh tokens, but I never understood the, the rationale behind it. So it's like, Yes, I have short-lived tokens, but I have these magic other cookies which can be used to get new tokens. So I just, I just push the problem to the other side of the room and pretend that the problem doesn't exist now. So then you have a long-term token, so it, it doesn't solve anything. So, so for, for this uh, distributed stuff, maybe those are the few cases where it actually makes sense to use such a thing because there you are you are essentially replicating a certificate. It's just without public keys being present. But uh, it's like a SAML assertion, I guess. We just use JavaScript because that makes everything better. Uh, right? Right? No, I heard TypeScript is better <laughs> or not. Uh, but, but it has more Microsoft in it, so it must be good. Okay. So the outcome uh, is uh, always stateful. I'm not saying always stateful. So I've understood that no, some no. people said that uh, there might be lower risk operations where the risk is lower. And sure, risk is, is not an all or nothing approach. You need to weigh in what's the worst that could happen and what's the... <laughs> Yeah, and 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 what's the what's the uh, probability of that worst thing happening, and and what would that cause? And if that says, oh, we 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 don't care, then it's not a problem. But but maybe design your system so that this is not the bottleneck for you. So so people has have had uh, sessions on big sites for ages. It's just some people say it's it's a typical typical. Uh, version of the premature optimization principle. You know, uh, when I think it was Nuth who said that uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. But you have some 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 idea in your mind that that will be a performance problem. So I will optimize it without actually building the system and measuring whether that actually is. And obviously, he continues uh, after the the well-known uh, quotation that uh, in probably 95% of the cases premature optimization is a problem but maybe in 5% sure you can recognize it but in most cases it's, it's the Pareto principle that uh, most of the things in your program are not causing a bottleneck and you shouldn't spend any effort on trying to optimize it without actually measuring the impact of such optimization. Even for example Linus Torvalds uh, in the Linux kernel He's, he has this saying that, sure, for most things, use simple algorithms rather than overly optimized ones because it's probably not going to matter in the, in the big scheme of things, but it's much easier to debug and operate a system that is simple. Questions? Why is replay attacks not a concern? Sorry, what about replay attacks? Why, Why is there not a concern with these? <laughs> I mean, I can, I can take your token and use it again and again if I have access to the token. That's a feature. <laughs> well, it, it, de <laughs> it depends on what the token is for. So, uh, I already mentioned replay attacks when you are not using uh, tokens, but rather signing messages, for example, uh, yeah. HTTP requests. 
But in most cases you want the token to be replayable because you, you want it to, you know, refer to a set of claims. And those obviously won't change, but yeah, it all depends on what the, what the interaction is about. So yeah, there are some sometimes when replaying is a problem and sometimes it, it isn't. So, I mean, a session ID is replayable, so it, yeah. it, it, it's not about, uh, it's not Jolt specific. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, but if we want to fix, code fix uh, the stateless, uh, authentication mainly painful po problem for example a uh, replay attack uh, the, the outcome became a stateful authentication every time we need to store a state uh, about uh, the authentication about the use G G uh, W V T and uh, and it became stateful no <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess uh, it's 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 not that it's it's an unsolvable problem. It's just that some people uh, some people uh, tend to forget that uh, you need to think about these edge cases. So it's it's like many people don't realize that you need to have revocation in any kind of uh, token or certificate uh, building system. And uh, congratulations, you've reinvented sessions with all their problems and gained nothing <laughs> in the process. But the implementation you're using is less battle tested and you're at a higher risk of vulnerabilities. Uh, yeah, so I guess, for example, I've heard uh, of methodologies where they are avoiding uh, a shared, shared state in a way that there is no central server they are hitting for session data, but okay, we should use uh, Jotes and we will publish a list of revoked tokens, uh, a list of revoked tokens in a PubSub kind of database so that we are pushing the stuff. And that would actually make sense since uh, what, you are, what you are pushing is kind of a more rare event when you have to revoke something. And it might perform better, but it's something you need to think about. And my problem is usually with people who are not thinking these things through, but just say, yeah, we fixed, we implemented the easy 80% and that last 20%, uh, yeah, we shouldn't care about, that's probably not important. The unit test ran, so it might be, might, must be better. Uh, that's how developers work, right? Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, then uh, I think we'll have a bigger break so that we can all eat and then we'll be back with the lightning talks and uh, Stefan's NSA talk. Thank you.